In an advisory meeting today, NASA disclosed a few more details about how it is planning to transition from a world of the International Space Station as it has been for over 20 years to a new era of commercial space stations. Little details like when it is being deorbited and how it is going to be deorbited and what is going to be saved before the ISS is deorbited and burned up in Earth's atmosphere, as well as international collaborations and the ways that NASA is encouraging commercial industry to take over a lot of what government has traditionally done. I'm going to go over a lot of these little updates that was given today at the NASA Advisory Council Human Exploration and Operations Committee meeting. This is a committee that is independent of NASA that gives NASA advice, or it's supposed to give NASA advice, based on NASA's presentations that it gives during the committee meetings. And I'm Lara Forsick. I'm the executive director of space consulting firm Astrolytical. So I pay attention to a lot of these meetings and try to understand what NASA is doing and what might be missed or what the recommendations might be from these independent committees. One of the main takeaways that I had was a shift in the way of NASA's thinking when it comes to a gap between post-International Space Station and pre-commercial LEO destinations, CLDs. That's NASA's term for commercial space stations. So in a perfect world, there would be no gap. In a perfect world, these new commercial space stations would be launched and become operational before the International Space Station is retired in around 2030. However, in years past, there has been such a concern about a gap where the ISS is retired before commercial space stations come online because of primarily the lack of funding from Congress. Congress really, in years past, did not fund the CLD program the way that NASA had asked it to. Over the years, we have seen an increase in that funding and an increase in what these commercial LEO destinations, these space station providers, have been doing. To summarize it really quickly here, I'm not going to go over all the details of all the commercial space stations. I do have a separate video on that. The first CLD that was funded by NASA was Axiom Space. Axiom Station is envisioned to attach to the International Space Station. They're planning for three modules initially to attach to the ISS that would then separate from the ISS before the ISS is deorbited and burned up in Earth's atmosphere. So then Axiom Station will become a free-flying space station post-ISS. Then there were additional awards. There was Starlab, which is run by Voyager Space. There is Orbital Reef, which is a partnership between Blue Origin, Sierra Space, and others. NASA has also awarded some unfunded agreements. For example, a Space Act agreement with VAST, which is working on Haven 1, which because of its small size and speed, might actually become the first commercial space station to be launched, currently targeting 2025. So one little detail brought up in the meeting today is that next year, NASA hopes to award the next phase of the CLD contracts, and they hope to award more than one. It's one of the main reasons why NASA cares is because it wants to keep on doing the science that it has been doing for decades in low Earth orbit. So going back to what I was saying about a slight transition of mindset with this gap, November of last year during the same committee meeting, there was a almost um, acceptance of the fact that there may be a gap. You know, they didn't want a gap. NASA did not want a gap. But during the presentation, it was understood that, that NASA may need to accept a gap, even if it doesn't want it. And it might just be the wording that was used or the people who were presenting this time round. That was Robin Gatons and Ken Bowersox. They really emphasized the fact that they wanted to have continuous access, continuous human habitation of low Earth orbit. At the very end, Ken Bowersox emphasized that, you know, sometimes things are out of your control and you just can't help it. But the real discussion was that, no, we want to avoid a gap, at, if at all possible. There are scientific and geopolitical reasons, mainly geopolitical reasons, why NASA does not want a gap in low Earth orbit. They want to ensure that NASA remains a leader in human spaceflight. And if you have the Chinese Chang'an Space Station, that is the only place to do human spaceflight and human-tended science experiments in space in low Earth orbit, well, then that's where the national partners are going to go. But unfortunately, it's not up to NASA. It's really up to the budget. So the committee today, they had a finding at the end. The exact wording of the finding was not finalized at the end of the meeting. But basically, it said that they wanted to support NASA in getting extra money, getting the, the appropriate funds from Congress to make sure that there is no gap in human accessibility of low Earth orbit. And that brings me to another topic that was discussed today, which is the ISS National Laboratory. The ISS National Lab is on the International Space Station. It's right there in the name, right? And the concept of having a national lab in space, while it's good for the time being, it doesn't translate well to commercial space station. It's different from the U.S. national labs that are here on the ground. 
And so to use the wording National Lab is a bit problematic, and you can't keep on calling it the ISS National Lab in a post-ISS world. So I have actually have a video on this topic if you want to check that out later. And full disclosure, I used to be employed by ISS National Lab. The update that was given today was they're moving away from the language of National Laboratory, and instead they're moving towards the language of Institute, because an institute doesn't need to have one single laboratory. It uh, also doesn't need to be compared to the National Labs here on Earth. The whole timeline issue kind of hinges on this deorbit vehicle. I have yet another video where I talked about how SpaceX is designing this ISS deorbit vehicle to bring the International Space Station down and into the Pacific Ocean. So if you want to watch that video, it's right here. And that is what really sets the clock. According to the presentations today by NASA, as soon as the ISS deorbit vehicle attaches to the ISS, it's one year until it deorbits. Like that's the timeline that they're giving it. And the reason for that is because they want to do checkouts. They want to make sure the ISS deorbit vehicle is working appropriately while the ISS still has attitude control. So while the ISS is still under the control of NASA, it wants to make sure this deorbit vehicle is working properly. And so if there is a desire to extend the lifetime of the ISS, that means delaying the launch of the ISS deorbit vehicle. Another thing that was brought up was the topic of what are we taking out of the ISS and bringing back down to Earth for, let's say, the Smithsonian Museum, which apparently sent NASA a list already of items that it wants in the museum. Robin Gaten said that they are evaluating small items. So they can't bring back whole modules, but they can bring back small items from the ISS in SpaceX Dragon, in Sierra Space's Dream Chaser, which is currently scheduled for uh, no earlier than December of this year for its first launch. And they could possibly put some things into Axiom Station. So Axiom Station is staying up there, right? While the two stations are still together, they could transfer items, small items, from the ISS to Axiom Station with Axiom's approval. In previous meetings like this, NASA has discussed the fact that it's not entirely up to them about what they bring back. It's also up to international partners. And the topic of international partners got brought up a few times in this meeting. For one, NASA wants to continue international partnerships with microgravity payloads and experiments post ISS. So even though ISS is going to be no longer there, NASA wants to keep on having those international partnerships with other types of microgravity experimentation that might be on commercial space stations. And I have a whole video about how commercial space stations are actually becoming more international, even though they're run by US companies. So for example, Starlab is becoming very international. So I have a video about that if you wanna check that out. There was an interesting presentation in the meeting from NASA SCAN, that's the Space Communications and Navigation. And that runs, for example, TDRS and other types of satellites that do communications in space. And this presentation was all about how the infrastructure has not kept up at all, which is actually a National Space Committee finding in a report they released last week or a week or two ago. NASA is moving away from doing its own satellite infrastructure in space and relying a bit more on the commercial space industry. The NASA presenter, Greg Heckler, he mentioned that some companies are already using commercial options. For example, Polaris Dawn, that was a SpaceX private commercial mission, they used Starlink. They were also using TDRS, that's the NASA satellites, but they were also using Starlink, which is SpaceX's own constellation for communications. He also mentioned, although he did not name, that Starlink is being used on one of the commercial space stations. That's probably Vast Haven 1, but he didn't name it. So I don't know if there's any other agreements that are put in place for any other commercial space stations using Starlink. And he mentioned some other providers that are providing communications for the space industry outside of NASA. One thing he didn't mention, which was just announced minutes before I started recording, which is NASA awarding Intuitive Machines a contract for $4.82 billion for communication and navigational services in near space, the near space network, which is essentially Earth and Moon and cislunar space. I really don't think that the space industry will have transitioned the mindset of a post ISS world until the ISS is really being deorbited, until we can't rely on the ISS anymore. And so for us to enter a new era of commercial space stations and commercial companies doing what NASA and other government agencies have traditionally done, I think that's just something that we're going to have to get used to over time. And although NASA is really budget scrapped at the moment, it's really budget limited, I do hope that NASA can get enough budget to help make these commercial space stations come on board without a gap, because I'm really looking forward to that future as well.